Welcome aboard the Athletics Can't Wait Jets podcast, your nonstop shop for all things Jets with Tim McMaster, Zach Rosenblatt, and Marissa Dunn. Can't wait! Hey everyone, it is over. The 2022 Jets season finishes with a whimper and a 7-10 and record. Six straight losses, a 12th straight season. Watching the playoffs from home, we're here to start to pick up the pieces on the Can't Wait podcast. I'm Tim McMaster, along with Zach Rosenblatt and Marissa Dunn. And you probably thought things couldn't get any worse. <laughs> I have news for you. They can, because we are also joined by our old friend and pod family like member, it. Connor Hughes, NFL insider at SNY. Welcome, Connor. Boo. I'm happy to be back. Even though I'm clearly very, very rusty because I might have tweeted out the wrong website. Oh, no, I did. I tweeted out the right one. Okay, we're good. I'm a little nice. rusty. All I'm right. so excited to be back. I can't wait. I tell, it's, it's pun intended. Um, yeah, when Zach uh, shot me the text message, it was like, hey, you want to come on for the season uh, season finale one? I was like, hell yeah, let's do it. Because I think that's the this is like the one thing that I've truly missed since I uh, since I left the athletic was having like this outlet to come on after every, after every game. But I know you guys have done a great job. Clearly the budget's been increased with that uh, <laughs> now moving intro and all that stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to see Zach show up and can't wait swag. And then I'm really going to start to lose my oh, mind. I, I do need some can't wait up. swag. I need a hat. I, need I do have my uh, new athletic oh. sweatshirt on. Oh, those are really comfortable. Oh yeah. The new aren't ones they? come in. Yeah. They're yeah. very yeah. comfortable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's new a zip up though. And you know what the worst is with like some of these sweatshirts is every time you wash them, the string goes through the back, like the, yes. the hood. I just took mine out because we have the old gray ones. Yeah, I just took mine out and like I still wear it all the time. I yeah, wear it. yeah. But yep, shout out. All right, so I was gonna start by asking you, Connor, if you wanted to talk about golf before we get to the Jets or <laughs> have stadium been able to play. food. But you know oh, what? So you know what? We you. actually have news that we've kind of all known about, but it's not out there in the public world. Um, so. So I think we should start there because we're, this show has always been about Two people have news, moments, right? right? Like weddings, <laughs> engagements. Um, me none and my wife that. obviously had a baby. None of and that for now, me. There's, none of those news Zach. items are mine. Yeah. <laughs> Zach, we need to work on that in 2023. Is Zach life, yes. Zach, life stages. Uh, but now we can announce that not one, but two Marissa and more. I are pregnant. Can't wait. Babies are on the way. Not together. Phrasing, right. phrasing, phrasing, phrasing. <laughs> yeah, let's make that very yeah. clear. Yeah. Uh, Marissa, Marissa obviously is expecting with Michael. I'm, I'm expecting with Bree, which is great. But I think what's the best part was when we found out that each other was pregnant or was expecting was immediately like, because you guys know me, I'm a big mouth guy. Like I talk yes. and, and blabber all the <laughs> damn time. And so I can't keep anything inside. So the whole like, you know, I didn't know that like you get pregnant and it's not like, boom, you can immediately just start oh, texting yeah. people. So like Brie and I found out and we were like, oh, my God, like, what, what are we going to like? I was like, <laughs> I need to tell people. And she's like, no, you can't until like 12 like, weeks or something. Yeah. yeah, really it's a wild number like that. So I was like, damn, I can't tell anyone. So finally, when we got the clearance, like I went to the can't wait chat. and I was like, guys, guess what? Brie and I are pregnant. And then uh, Marissa goes, uh. I have an announcement to make too. Well, so Connor, <laughs> Connor sent the picture. So Connor is due in the middle of June and I am due like July 1st. So we are very, very close. Um, and we weren't telling a ton of people at the time. And Connor sent the picture and I was like, how do I not be like, oh my gosh, no yeah. way, me too. But I also, you know, going back to Connor having a big mouth. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. well, I haven't told tell him anyone. yet. I haven't You're told like, do him. I tell him? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't told anybody yet. So like at work, you know, just my like one boss knew. So I was like, oh, I don't know. Should I say anything? But I couldn't not say it. And Connor didn't tell anybody. So I was pretty shocked. I did. That. No, no, he, no, he, he was good. Really he he really did good. eventually. Uh, we, I'm in another group message with him that we text each other. Like he did eventually be like, you guys can't say anything, but Bree's pregnant. And, like, <laughs> and yeah. it like came out yeah. of nowhere too. We were like talking about yeah. something uh, completely unrelated to him. <laughs> yeah. Blurted yeah. It out. He's like, I have to say it. Yeah. Right. So and then what's funny is like, after I said that in that group chat, Bree, like a day later was like, you, you know, we're still not at the point uh, where we can start telling people uh, yet. And I was like, uh, yeah, I, I just, definitely haven't yeah, told anyone. Definitely. Yet, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> well, you totally. Know, Brie, like my wife's still like type A and like everything needs to be planned out and stuff yes. like that. Like we're even talking like my cousin's like coming down from uh, New York on Friday. And we were saying I was like, oh, I told my I told Brie like later. I was like, oh, yeah, Peter's coming over. And she's like, what do you mean Peter's coming over? I was like, I don't know. Peter's coming over. She's like, well, do you have anything planned? I was like, I don't know. Maybe we'll go get dinner, order pizza, get a few beers, play video games. Like, I don't know. She's like, but the house isn't clean. I was like, who gives a shit? It's my cousin. Like, like it's like, that's how me she's like, no, plan it out. So when she was telling her friends and her family, like everything had to be planned out for me, she's like, well, how are you going to tell people? I was like, I uh, text them. 
So, what do you mean text him? I was like, text him and say you're pregnant. Like, it's pretty simple. Like, boom, you're pregnant. Like, so I told everyone. It's like, yeah, yeah, Bree's pregnant, by the way. Yeah, surprise. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was fun, though. But I can't wait. It's like we're, we're finally – she's showing now. Like, we're not – I don't know. Like, uh, this is – I like I said, you know, it wasn't – I still get tweets and texts from people that are like uh, – you know, remember like when you didn't know babies could eat like real food like when Tim <laughs> told you and stuff like that so i told um like i'm learning so much like so where the baby is growing in brie like we're apparently not going to be able to feel the kick for like an extra week or something like that so we oh. i don't know if mercy you felt like whole, you know <laughs> punching and stuff but we're, we've been good like brie went through the whole first trimester without any sicknesses and stuff yeah, like me that too, thankfully just yeah, tired. Like, i liked uh, i liked yes. all the i yes. liked when the mike white stuff uh the, with the story i wrote uh, came out and then con and you had like the same realization as him like wait oh wins are yeah. thing <laughs> yeah dude there was when we went for the first checkup like the first ultrasound thing and and Bree's like we're sitting in the parking lot waiting to go in because it's still like they still have their covid rules or whatever yeah and we're sitting there and Bree goes she's like yeah she goes this is also where we'll find out if we'll have twins and i was like i'm sorry what <laughs> like, yeah, two in there. We just, i was like and immediately my heart sank and i'm like i'm still coming to the grips with one like what do you mean there's gonna be two in there but yeah what's great she's showing now which is cool like i said we're second trimester so she's kind of evened out with it i'm i'm more pumped up to see what her cravings are going to be like we were just talking about it before like is there gonna be any random things she hasn't really craved anything yet yeah so me neither yeah, no, you're, you're, no, you're excited to have a designated driver for a while. That's what you're <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I've already taken advantage because I well, what's funny is like when I was 21, I turned 21 before Bree. So I was like, sweet, I'm going to have a designated driver. And that did not work when I was 21 because Bree's like, uh, no, just because you can go to the bars doesn't mean I'm going to go and like just sit in the parking lot. But now <laughs> that she's pregnant, she's like much more open to the idea of like, oh, yeah, you'll drive there. I'll drive home. It's like, sweet, let's go. So <laughs> this I've, is I've uh, definitely been, uh, to, to pay that Ubers. back, Connor, just to just to. Think about this. When home, when not out drinking, when home though, come up with some mocktails. Yes. Those go over. Oh, yes. Do you make have her, recipes? Because I've mocktails. asked that for Brie. Yeah. yeah. I've asked that. So if you have recipes, I am going to steal that from you because sure. she, uh, I brought that up and, and it's, she came home the other day with um, non alcoholic wine, but it was oh, not God. very good. Like, no, it's, it's, it's called it grape juice. Like what yeah, you, I was just saying grape yeah, juice. Yeah, it's basically <laughs> what it was. It was like bitter grape or juice. Sparkling like, apple cider or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, um, sorry, that's what we popped when we did our gender reveal. So. <laughs> so the chat wants to know if Connor, you're gonna take a, a health class. Is are you gonna take a seventh grade health class? <laughs> I'm, pretty sure I'm gonna have to. <laughs> I think I'm gonna. I, I actually just looked into it as we're about to head back to New Jersey for the off season. I just looked into the New Jersey baby basics and CPR. Oh, classes. you want to take them together? So, Oh, I think no. that would be oh, I think no. that would be pure comedy. <laughs> can I like practice Michael. underneath can I like go Michael. underneath Michael? Like I'm taking a snap. Like, huh, huh, huh. like can we do it that well, way? I, I had to tell Mike I'm gonna like totally throw him under the under the bus and he actually might be listening, but um, <laughs> he, he thought you changed a baby on their stomach the other day. Um, so there was that. Like he thought you put the All baby right. on their belly and then that's how you <laughs> Connor didn't know that either. <laughs> Connor's writing, Connor's down, writing down, that no, down real quick. Put the baby on the <laughs> no no stomach. baby on no belly. stomach. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we got a lot to learn over here, but um you and Michael will be great dads. So and obviously Bree and so. I will be great moms. That's like a no-brainer. <laughs> I will I will say Connor does send me texts sometimes that have me worried. You know, like yesterday he, he asked me how do yes. I eat ramen? Uh was yes. the text I got yesterday. <laughs> Yes, that is a little concerning. I can't even find need, the noodles in my ramen to start. You need to set up a webcam that, um, you know, you could get some funny, capture some funny moments. Of, like, yeah, that'd know, be, yeah, that'd be These good, late good night content. feeds when you're like, you don't know what you're doing. And, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, Connor just getting frustrated. Yeah. <laughs> and being yes. really tired. Oh, there's, yeah, Bree's already told me a lot. I, I, what I've actually been happy with so far is just like, the, we don't have a name picked out, obviously, but like our name process has been going pretty good too, where it's like we yeah. haven't had any like, Bree's thrown a couple out there where I've been like, no, but like most of them we've <laughs> is been. Your, is your baby going to gonna be on the all name team, Connor? Mm, that's the question. pressure. So that's yeah, people are, like when people I, are looking, so I didn't yeah. say anything on Twitter until now. Like, so Twitter didn't really know. Instagram did because Bree did a video and I did get DMs. And on you Instagram, reposted like, it. Has to be the all name team. Has to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Bree wanted to try to go viral. And I was like, I don't think. I've got that. <laughs> it was very <laughs> cute video. It was a very cute video. I haven't announced yeah, yeah, yeah. it on Instagram yet. So we were hoping we, that we, gotta take like, some pictures. We, we were hoping that you would get like shot in the face by pink powder or something, but it didn't work out. That, <laughs> that was, yeah. I, yeah. Well, my, a bunch of my friends obviously were like, are you going to do a golf ball? Like, cause obviously they know oh, yeah. golf are you going to hit the golf ball? I was like, my best friend, Matt was the one I was talking to about. And he goes, I was like, dude, I was like, you have known me since elementary school. I was like, do you think I have the clutch DNA with like 20 people watching me to stand over a golf ball and make yes. contact? And he goes, 
so what else are you doing? I was like, exactly, <laughs> dude. We're going to pull strings and have everyone shoot it at us. It's easier yeah. that way. That was that was why Michael didn't want to do something complicated because he had a fear of it like not happening or, you know, not breaking or like these gender reveals gone wrong or, you know, oh, yeah. like, Kirk Cousins throws the ball and miss, barely make, makes the target, yeah. you know? Yeah, that's so we went with a cupcake, him. but still with yeah. a cupcake, he couldn't even really find the icing in the cupcake. So Well, I loved um, Michael just eating the cupcake. Yeah, I, I was sitting there crying over the fact yes. that like Marissa's like, oh my god, it's I don't know if you've said uh, gender yeah. yet. Uh, it's like, oh my god, it's a blank, and and Michael's like just sitting there eating the cupcake. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you can eat the cupcake after the video. I'm excited too though now that because Tim's Tim, how old how old um your kid? Eight. How old your how old your daughter? Six, Sixteen months yesterday. All right, so they're right oh. in the same range here. So like, what yeah. I feel like we can do now is we can have Mandy, Marissa, Bree all watch the kids, and we're all gonna go out and golf. Mm. We'll see how yep. that goes, Connor. I think so. I think that's a perfect plan. Zach, you're muted. Yeah. Yeah. I said it, but when I have a kid five to ten years from now, then 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 your kids can watch. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there yeah you then go. we have babysitters. Then we have yeah, free babysitters. babysitters. I'm a few steps away from that though. But... <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're gonna fulfill We are, uh, we are eleven minutes into this yes. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All and it's going yeah. about as well as I expected. I think this is better than golf talk though. I yes, mean, we did mention yeah. golf in there, but this is better than golf. <laughs> Baby talk is always better than Baby golf. Baby talk. Yes, yes. But we got a lot of a lot of Jets talk to get yes, to, right, do. Tim? Yeah, let's do that. Good that transition. Transition, transition Timmy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So yesterday was pack up the locker room day, whatever you want to call it, bag day. There's so many, you know, whatever. But anyway, the Jets said goodbye to the 2022 season. Um, and so there's a lot to talk about here. So the way we're going to do this, since we have Connor and Zach, two insiders with us today, uh, is I'm just going to set this stuff up and you guys can kind of take it from there. Um, so let's start here because um, I think it, it was kind of the theme of your story, Zach, on The Athletic, um, the T-shirts that were hanging in the lockers yesterday when the players got there, which said, finish, which, you know, Robert Sala this, this is something he's very good at, right? The, the little motivational things. Yeah. Um, this one brought some quick jokes, I think. I think the immediate reaction by a lot of fans was like, finished? <laughs> but um, finish. Like and, he, and he took it a step though. forward by saying, this means finishing your workout, finishing you know this, finishing that. It starts now, blah, blah, blah. So my first thing for you guys is, what do we think of finish? Do we, do we like it? Is, is this a good one? Uh, is it, did he go too far? Like, what, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a little you go first, Zach, it's your show. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, it, you, I get what he's doing. And it is a little, this one's a little on the nose more than the other ones. I would say I, his, his quote about like, uh, you know, it's not just about at the end of the season, it's about finishing workouts, games, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, ultimately the fans are going to get mad every time these come out now until they start winning and they start getting closer to the playoffs and stuff like that. So, uh, as soon as I, I tweeted out that those shirts were in the in the locker, I knew it was not going to be like a positive reaction, unfortunately. Yeah. The other thing I thought was like, did the shirts come with receipts? Oh, yeah. But anyway. Ah! Ah! That's good. I like that. <laughs> no, I, Connor. Get, I, I get yeah, I get what they're doing, right? I mean, it's it's the it's like I think Sala, the way that he described it, right, was um Last year, they simulated a finish because they were eliminated from the playoffs, right? So that final month of the season, we're like, let's let's practice as if we are we are playing the final month of meaningful games and we have to get in. And and then this year was one where they actually lived it. And now the whole mantra is like, finish it and get through. And and I get it, and it's cool. But I think at the end of the day, like with the Jets, is that it's just, and and I actually said this after the first game of the season because the Jets lost to the Ravens or whatever it was, and and they they had it kind of close for a moment there, and then it wasn't close, and it was close, and it wasn't close, and and you know I remember Salah talking after it that at his post game press conference, and he had like a very positive spin, and my takeaway from that whole game was like, dude, no one wants to hear that anymore, right? And 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 I don't think anyone does want to hear it anymore. I, I don't think it's about. Uh, talking it. I don't think it's about saying it. I don't think it's about cool things on t-shirts. I think it's about going out there and doing it, right? I mean, the Jets have the longest playoff drought right now of any NFL team. I mean, it's been over a decade since they've been in there. We've had regime after regime after regime come through this door and no one's been able to crack the code to get in. And when the Jets started six and three, seven and four, well, that was the position of like, yo, this team's going in. Like, I remember I was, I was BSing on Twitter and even talking like you guys in the group chat that like, I went from not covering any playoff game throughout my entire career to now I've got to hope the Jets play on Saturday and the Giants play on Sunday so I can fly from one destination to the other. And to go from that 
to finishing 0-6 down the stretch. I mean, that's just – it's. I understand when you look at the totality of what the Jets have accomplished this year, and you can say, like, if we handed this to you on paper and it was like, this is what the Jets are going to do, I think everyone and their uncle would have been like, hell yeah, I want to sign up for that. Like, we're going to win seven games, and Garrett Wilson's going to be a stud, and Sauce is going to be a stud, and Brees is going to be a stud, and – we're going to have meaningful games down the stretch and our playoff lives are going to last till the new year that it's like, hell yeah, like let's go. But when you start six and four, seven and three expectations change. And I understand the mantra of finish, finish, finish. But I think what a lot of jet fans have kind of had enough of is the mantras and is the sayings and is the t-shirts and all that stuff. Like they don't care about that anymore. What they want to see is what every single other team in the NFL has seen this decade and that's their team playing in the playoffs. And I know why the Jets aren't there, and it's all understandable reasons why they aren't not there. But enough's enough. Just get there. you know. And that's why Douglas has a playoff mandate and Salah has a playoff mandate and all that stuff this season. And the other question is, those guys have playoff mandates, but who will be the offensive coordinator? So let's go there next, Michael Floor. When I was watching the game Sunday, I, I texted you, Zach, and I said, if I was the owner watching this performance right now, I think mm-hmm. I would fire Mike LaFleur. But like, and I've been a guy who this whole season has said, no, you stick with him, stick with him. But like 12 straight quarters without a touchdown and not even, I mean, I guess not even that is hard to say. Like that's something that's significant. Not yeah, yeah, touchdown yeah. for three games, but they, it was, it was ugly not doing it right. Like it, it they weren't even close to scoring a touchdown. Um, it's just been bad offense. I think, having taken a couple days from that reaction, I think back to what you've said on this show about like, well, who, who are you going to replace him with? Who's going to be the West coast guy that comes in here. So I think that the move, the right move is probably to stay the course and know that this guy is so young and he has been learning on the job and we'll see what happens. But man, he is not making it easy on him on Robert Sala fighting to keep him. Is he? Yeah. Sunday was, Sunday was weird to me. Um, it, it felt like they were, I mean, I, and I get it to agree, their offensive line was an absolute dumpster fire on Sunday, as much as it's been all season. Um, they have dudes who are probably not going to be in the league next year playing. Um, so I get why he was kind of scared to really, LaFleur, I get why he was scared to, like, call anything. Um, sorry, there's a vacuum going crazy right now. I don't know if you guys can hear it. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, like, they they were, he was not calling anything, like, I don't know. They, they were not taking any sort of risk. They were not doing anything <coughs> creative. Uh, I didn't really. But get they, it. I mean, they ran the ball. In, what was it? Yeah. Third and thirteen. Yeah, they a couple give up plays. That, they, there was no creativity whatsoever. And um, I don't know. Maybe they were scared. Of, okay, is what's worse being being boring or like turning the ball over a bunch of times? I don't know. Um, but I mean, Joe Flacco was getting hit like every play. Like it was it was a mess. Ultimately, I don't think Lafleur's job should come down to that that game. I think it's it's ridiculous whenever anybody's job comes down to one game. Because if you're doing that, then you probably don't want to keep that person, and that shouldn't be like the the thought process. But um, like I've talked about on here, and Connor and I have talked about it, and um, getting rid of him is not going to fix their problem. <laughs> getting rid of Floor does not fix your quarterback, uh, like their current quarterback situation. At least it does not fix offensive line that was so banged up this year to a degree that they had six different starting tackles on the injured reserve. And so, like I, I get the frustration and. I get why fans want to change. And I think offensive coordinator is the position more than any other that, that fans look at. And even I think some owners get to listen to the noise where they, they look at uh, offensive coordinators. Okay. The offense sucks. So get rid of the offensive coordinator. The next one will come in and he'll change everything and it'll be good. Um, It's not, it's just not that simple. So, and on top of that, like we've talked about on here, if, if they have a playoff mandate and they don't make the playoffs, the staff's not going to be here a year from now. So why would a offensive coordinator who's not already in the building want to come here for that job? I think what, what blew my mind with it was like I, I, I assumed that everyone knew the pressure was on the floor and, and everyone knew the, 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 the target was on the floor for, for that game. And we were talking about it in the media room going into that one, that it was almost like this dude's going to unload the clip. Like, like it mm-hmm. is just going to be like just everything is on the display. Everything's out there. You know, Woody Johnson's watching like basically audition to keep your job and audition to show why you should continue to be this team's yeah, or audition to get gonna... your next job. If you can't see. Yeah. Him. Right. Well, I mean, he's got his, his name and, and friends in the yeah. league. He's going to get a job no matter where he goes. It just probably won't be a coordinator to start, but um, it, it's, it's, it was like, show the trick place, show the, yeah. the, the innovation, show the craziness, just go, go batshit basically in that game and, and have fun and be like, Oh wow. Look at what we can do when this is there or that there. And instead the way the jets, operated and played that game 
is how they tried to operate and play every game when they were dealing with their quarterback issues and we were still trying to make the playoffs, which was basically like, okay, we don't really have the pieces on offense right now with the offensive line and with the quarterback. So what we need to do is we need to get it into the fourth quarter, have it be a one possession game, and then try to pull it out. Basically what the Giants have done so successfully, you know, swim out, pull them out to the deep end when it really matters in the fourth quarter and see if it works and see if you can swim with us. And when you are playing for something meaningful in terms of playoff positioning or when you really need the victory, I get that stance, but the Jets were eliminated from the playoffs. I mean, we saw the Detroit Lions running hook and ladder plays and all this crazy stuff in their game when they were eliminated from the playoffs just because they're out there having fun and enjoying it. And I just felt like the Jets took that stance in that game of let's just try to get through it. Let's just try to get through it. Let's try to survive. And when you've got Joe Flacco in his last game and you've got the offensive line dealing with their issues, you can't just run the vanilla offensive game plan because when you have that much of a talent deficiency on that side of the ball, it's going to be impossible to even do vanilla. So you got to throw all these crazy little doohickey and, and twists and turns in there to try to make it work. And the fact that the Jets didn't, I walked away from that game basically thinking to myself, yeah, that's probably the last time we're going to see LaFleur on the Jets sideline. That's what I thought if, after that game because it was – when you look at the totality of the last month of the season, when you look at the way things had struggled, when you looked at the Jets kind of getting embarrassed in that game against Miami, it was like, Woody Johnson's going to want somebody to pay. He's not going to fire Douglas. He's not going to fire Sala. So who is he going to fire? It's going to have to be Mike LaFleur. And I think where that, I, I didn't, I made this very, very clear that I didn't agree with it for the, the myriad of reasons that Zach just said, where who are you going to replace him with? Uh, it's Michael Flory. They need a quarterback, all this fun stuff. No one's basically, no one's going to sign up to be this team's offensive coordinator. When you know that it's basically a one-year contract, uh, you have an owner that is clearly meddling and you don't have a quarterback at that point in time. Uh, that's kind of where I was, I was at, right. It was like, they shouldn't fire him, but it's Woody Johnson's. They're going to fire him. The way that Robert Sala talked to us on Monday is kind of when I started to change my thinking of like, you know what? I think Mike LaFleur might be safe. And the big reason for it is that basically what Robert told Zach and I and everyone that was in that room was that they are going to add a veteran presence to the offensive staff. They are going to do that. Gary Kubiak, somebody else, blah, blah, blah. I don't know who it's going to be, but they are going to fill that role that Greg Knapp was supposed to have before he tragically passed away. And then Matt Cavanaugh had for a year. They're going to fill that role. If they were conceivably to fire Mike LaFleur, they're not going to replace him with a uh, one-year, out of nowhere, random wide-out coach here. They're going to go get an established veteran presence. You don't need a veteran consultant if you're going to have a veteran offensive coordinator. So when Salah started talking about it like that, I started thinking, you know what, he's going to be back. And the other question I asked Salah in that press conference, too, is like, we're talking about Zach needs to fix his fundamentals. Zach needs to fix this. Zach needs to fix that. If he's working on fixing all that offseason and into training camp, and then you throw, oh, by the way, dude, you're learning a new offensive scheme on top of that. I mean, that's setting a quarterback up to fail even more when he's already been set up to fail. So it, I, I am still not like 99% saying LaFleur is absolutely coming back because I think that Woody Johnson can wake up tomorrow and completely yeah. change his means of thinking. But I do feel much more confident about LaFleur returning now on when we're recording this on Tuesday than I did talking or after that game on Sunday or when I first showed up at the Jets facility on Monday. Yeah, that, the, the Woody point was what I was about to say. He's he's the kind of the expert. Any, anything we say we think is going to happen, it, it ultimately comes down to Woody making emotional decisions. Um, <laughs> and the, re, the reality is Woody sees all the stats we've been tweeting. He sees all the anger from fans. Uh, we know he looks at all that and stuff. And fans tag him on Twitter fans all Fans tag him, yeah. I mean, he's on Twitter. He, he tweets probably more than any owner. <laughs> um, uh and so he, he like he knows the perception. He hears the noise. He sees all the stuff with the Giants. The Giants are in the playoffs and everybody keeps saying they don't have the talent, but they have the coaching. Like that's the thing you keep hearing about the Giants and they made Daniel Jones better. And and you just know that Woody is hearing all this and he's fuming about it and he wants to blame somebody for it. Uh, mm -hmm. If the floor is not fired, who is that going to be? Like that's that's the, like where I go back to. Like I, I'm like I'm like Connor. Like I left Sunday thinking he was gone. And then we get there Monday and the things people are saying like, I will say Garrett Wilson had a comment that didn't shine a great light on LaFleur. I don't, I don't know if he meant it on purpose or anything like that, but uh, he had, he had a quote where he said something like at the end of the season, when there was film on us, everybody knew what we were going to do before we did it essentially. Uh, and he said, so it was hard to get anything going on offense, which, you know, without saying you're talking about the play calling. So like yeah. stuff like that doesn't help. Reese Hall did throw support behind him. Um, I don't know what players think behind the scene. I haven't really dug into that that much. I don't get the sense anybody dislikes Mike. 
um, player wise. Maybe they're frustrated with some of the play calling and stuff like that. But yeah, I don't know. It's uh, Woody's the wild card here, and it, he's gonna want a face to their problems. And I don't know if Rob Calabrese or is enough or benching Zach Wilson is enough. So that that's where I go back to whether you know as the longer this lingers, you'd think he's safe, but I it also wouldn't shock me if we get to next week and all of a sudden Woody changes his mind too. Like it, yeah. anything anything's possible here. So this time frame more, could drag. You're saying right? Like it could yeah, be. Another I think it could drag before we. I, mean, I don't think they would actually wait a week. But my my point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at some point they're going to say he's coming back. Like, right. I think it'd be within the next 48 hours or so. I, I think within the next, like, I think if we, I, I think we'll know by Friday whether or not the Jets are changing. And like Zach said, like, somebody's got to pay, right? Like, I mean, because yeah. you can't have, at the end of the day, whether Zach Wilson is bad or not, somebody is going to have to pay for his lack of development. And, yeah. and generally, you're not just going to give up on the player and be like, oh, yeah, sorry, he stinks. We're going to move on from somebody else. Like, it's somebody. They're going to try to exhaust all measures to get out of Zach what they thought they were going to get out of Zach before they pull the plug on Zach, right? I mean, everyone gets chance after chance after chance. Ryan Leaf was on NFL teams after the Chargers, right? I mean, that's just what happens. Um, what I think could, though, change it all was that if you're not pulling the plug on the floor, I wonder if Sala thinks adding like a big veteran presence to the staff mm. will kind of ease that tension on the Woody, yeah. floor. Yeah, basically like saying like, you know what, we're going to keep, we're keeping them. Like we're, we are going to keep uh, LaFleur. However, we're going to add somebody like Gary Kubiak to the mix. And I think it's key like, that it's a guy like that too, because that's oh, a can't, can't, yeah, like, yeah, like, like a big right? name. Like, it has to be it's a not big just name, a, yeah. a somebody within the football coaching ranks that is known to be good. It's a guy that like everyone it's in America be legit. knows. Right? Gary Correct. Kubiak. It's got to be legit and somebody where it's it, look, I, this is honestly how it works with the Jets. Like Woody's on social media. It needs to be something that makes social media happy. It needs to be something that makes everybody who's going to be out there that's tweeting right now, like, you know, F Mike LaFleur, fire Mike LaFleur. It has to be the one that takes that masses, that, that, that very, very vocal minority the, and basically has them say, huh, good move. Yeah, maybe this will work. And if that happens, then Woody's going to be happy and everyone's going to be happy and everyone's going to be go going into next season singing Kumbaya. But that's the key for, for Sala now is finding that person. And, you know, if they can, I, I think Kubiak would be that guy. Uh, I'm sure there's a number of other veterans out there that, that could be the person as well. All right, but let's take Kubiak, a quick I break. Like a plus. Yeah, we got a lot more to get to. We're going to talk about Zach Wilson, Quinn and Williams and more. So stay with us. Winter mornings are brutal. So here's my tip for tackling the day in comfort. Grab new Tommy John loungewear and take cozy wherever you go. When you start the year in Tommy John, you're that much more comfortable so you can do everything better. Tommy John loungewear pajamas and underwear have dozens of comfort innovations like luxurious soft tri blend and micro modal fabrics with four-way stretch and no lint ball or fuzz. With over 20 million pairs sold and thousands of five-star reviews, people love Tommy John. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers, they have fanatics. If you work from home like myself, it's so perfect and so comfortable to wear throughout the day. Get 20% off your first order at tommyjohn.com slash athletic. 20% off right now at tommyjohn.com slash athletic. See site for details. Hey guys, there are a lot of men out there who want a better sex life. Unfortunately, up to 50% of men have symptoms that get in the way of wanting or enjoying sex. But Roman is here to help. Roman is the digital health clinic for men, addressing a variety of sexual health needs and offering genuine medication that helps achieve and maintain your sex goals. In men with low T, getting testosterone levels back to normal can help increase your libido. Roman offers a testosterone test, which includes lab processing, and if it's appropriate for you, treatment for low testosterone. So how does it work? First, complete an online visit detailing your symptoms and medical history. A U.S.-licensed healthcare professional will review your information and make a personalized treatment recommendation. Roman will then ship your treatment in discreet packaging, and they'll do it for free two-day shipping if prescribed. At Roman, there are no waiting rooms. There's no hassle. It's just straightforward digital technology from the comfort of your own home. To learn more about how you can achieve your personal sexual health goals, go to ro.co slash athletic today to get 20% off your first order. That's ro.co slash athletic. 
All right, welcome back to the Can't Wait Podcast with Connor Hughes back with us this week uh, for the first time since his departure to SNY. Doing great work at SNY, by the way, Connor. I will, I will <laughs> Thank say you, man. that. I appreciate it's that. enjoyable seeing you, you know, on TV more. We should give you that little plug here. Um, all right, so we finished the last segment talking about the addition of a quarterback guru, so to speak, a Gary Kubiak type, somebody to help the quarterback room. So that brings us to the topic of is that person coming in to help Zach Wilson or to help whoever the new quarterback is for the Jets? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's pretty obvious that Zach is not going to be, at least to me, uh, that Zach won't be the starter. I, they they, they, they kind of had a company line yesterday that they were, they were saying a lot of the same stuff and they kind of were like avoiding say, committing to anything. I think J- Joe and Sala to a degree probably learned their lesson with like making bold statements about guys <laughs> in general, like jet for life and all that stuff, which we'll get into with Quinnen, but um, but you know, they're saying all the stuff about we're committed to developing him these next three months until OTAs are all about Zach and getting his mental right. And, and, you know, Zach saying the right things about wanting to compete against all these guys. But the, at the end of the day, you can't go into a season with statistically, if not the worst quarterback to start out his career for a first round pick, like one of the three to five worst quarterbacks that has ever come out of the league. Uh, and he had, a, he had an awful season and, and, and he hasn't shown anything that make you believe that he can live up to his so-called potential. And you can't just like they, they're too good now to play a guessing game and too many people's jobs are on the lines and they can say they believe in him all they want. If you actually believed in him, you would commit to him as your starter. So um, I, I don't I don't think Zach Wilson is. I mean, I'm not going to say he'll never start a game again for this team because I kind of have a feeling he's going to be the backup next year. Um, but I they're going to go all in on trying to find get a veteran quarterback, whether that's Jimmy G, whether that's Derek Carr, whether that's trading for somebody big like Lamar or whatever. Um, I, I just don't see them going into next season with Zach Wilson as their number one quarterback. I, I don't think that's a controversial take at this point, but, um, it is interesting that they have still gone with like the, they've gone full on support for him. And I, I get it. They can't admit mistake because they drafted him second overall. And like, like I talked about on here in the past, I, I looked it up and every single bus quarterback from the last 15 years, not a single head coach lasted three years after they drafted that guy, like not a single one. So the odds are stacked in the jets favor. And I, I think they just, they need to jump ship before it's too late. Yeah, that's it's it's that's what it is. It's that I I think I was always curious as to Joe Douglas is willing to like the old Brandon Marshall quote of like I'm going down on the boat with Fitz, and um, I, I was kind of always wor- wondering if Joe Douglas was willing to admit he was wrong on Wilson enough to go and in year three when the quarterback's supposed to be ascending and becoming the franchise player that you imagine to basically say no he's going to be our backup and we're going to go get the veteran and everything I've been able to turn up is that he is willing to do that and it's largely because Joe Douglas realizes he's going to be out of a job uh, if he does not get this team to the postseason and they realize that they are not going to go into the postseason with Zach Wilson or at least there is a substantial amount of evidence and proof that they are statistically that they are not going to go to the postseason with Zach. I mean, I know what everyone can say about the line and the floor and blah, 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 and all this stuff. I mean, here's, here's the the truth of it all. I mean, if Zach Wilson even turns out to be an average quarterback in the NFL, he will break everything that statistics have told us about quarterbacks to this point. Like he will be the anomaly of all anomalies, the outlier of all outliers. He will be the one that if he even turns out to be average, that makes everyone go back and say, well, if Zach Wilson actually turned out to be average, what did we do wrong here? Should we have stuck with this guy? Should we have done that? And again, you can say like, oh, I believe the Jets are going to do that. Oh, I'm going to believe it. But I mean, you got to you got to be having the greenest of all greens lenses on to make that statement. When you say, oh, the history of the NFL is wrong. This one player is right and we're going to get it right. You know what I mean? Like that's that's just the fact. So the Jets are going to have to go out there and get a player that they believe they can win with. And that player is probably either going to be Jimmy Garoppolo, Derek Carr, or because Woody Johnson is back making a splash of all splash moves for somebody like Lamar Jackson. And the one thing I've said this, I've said this a couple of times on SNY and stuff is that the comparison of making a big trade for a quarterback that I go back to is when Deshaun Watson was uh, pre-allegations available via trade. And I mean, you guys, remember I was doing this podcast when I was like, oh, I don't I don't think the Jets are going to go after Deshaun Watson. And people were at my throat over that stuff. But the reasoning for it was that the way that the Jets viewed a potential Deshaun Watson trade pursuit was that if they basically the package of picks that they would have had to have given up for Deshaun Watson, they needed to use those package of picks to make their roster 
a roster able to basically enjoy the fruits of the labor of having Deshaun Watson. They would have had to have traded everything that would have made their team good to get the quarterback, but now they don't have the assets to make the team around the quarterback good, and they were going to be a disaster. Uh, that's not the case anymore. The, the Jets over the last two years or so, they have acquired talent. They are a team that I think just about everyone can look at and say, we have the defense, a championship level defense. We have playmakers on offense. We need to fix the offensive line. We need to tinker here or there. But if you put a quarterback, if you put Lamar Jackson on this team, Derek Carr on this team, Jimmy Garoppolo on this team, the Jets are still playing football. And you can make the argument that they might have been competing with the Bills for the AFC East title. So in my opinion, that's really what this one comes down to is they need to go out there and get the quarterback. And it seems wholeheartedly that everyone within the building, Joe Douglas, Robert Sala, everyone understands that they need to go get the quarterback and they are going to go get the quarterback. And I know everyone's kind of up in arms right now about like, oh, is Zach Wilson going to be on the team? Is Zach Wilson not going to be on the team? Here's the thing. If we're talking about politics in, in the NFL and things like that, while the Jets are willing to admit that they need to go get a starting quarterback to begin next season and get a veteran and an established player, I still don't think Robert Sala, Mike LaFleur, Joe Douglas, all those guys, Rex Hogan, the whole lot of them, I don't think they're willing to admit yet that they can at least salvage the career of Zach Wilson because the mud that would be left on everyone's face to take a guy that you drafted second overall and trade him for a fifth or a sixth round pick, which is probably the best the Jets are looking to get for Zach Wilson to this point, that's just so not worth it compared to, you know what? Keep him in the farm system. Keep trying to develop him. Keep trying to turn him into anything. If we can, awesome, sweet, this is going to work. I think that's just the direction they're going to go with Zach Wilson. But as far as like keeping him as their starter, that's not going to happen. They can believe in him. They can say what they're going to say. They can pitch that company line like Zach said. But they'll have a new quarterback in here and as their starter week one of next year, barring injury. Yeah, you can't get rid of Zach until you're winning. I think that's like the cutoff, right? If you make the Correct. playoffs next mm, year, point. then you can get rid of Zach because everybody, nobody cares, right? But if yeah, you get rid exactly. of him now, it's just... Uh, uh, as for Zach, picture, everyone's going to be heralding like uh, everyone's going to be saying from the screen for the top of the drivers. Oh my God. Congratulations, Joe Douglas. Look, look at the guts he had to move on from the guy drafted second overall. And now we're in the playoffs. Oh, they'll be building statues again. Like that's, it's everyone's <laughs> it's the wave, man. You go, you, you ride the highs and the lows. Uh, as for Zach, he said when asked about being a backup, basically next year, if, if they bring in somebody to start in front of him. I'm going to make that dude's life hell in practice every day. I'm going to go out there and do my best to show the coaches that I deserve to be there. Of course, he's had two years to do that, and it has not gone yeah. well. But that, uh, that's where we're at. Um, all right, next topic, Quinn Williams, who has been a model citizen, right? Like, great, great season. MVP of this team. Tremendous leader of this defense. Oh. Um, focused on football all year. But the day after the season ended, he brought up the money. So it's time, guys. So this these things have gone bad. For, let's be honest. These situations yep. have gone badly for the Jets consistently over mm -hmm. recent years. So is Quinn and Williams the first time where, like, <laughs> the Jets get this done before voluntary workouts? Quinnen is here um, throughout the offseason with a big smile on his face as one of the highest-paid defensive linemen in football. Yeah. I, so let I let me I was, say it this way. Let me real quick, Zach. Does yeah. it get done before voluntary workouts, mm. before training camp, or does it get ugly? There's like three options there, right? <sighs> that's I, see that that's that's a good question. Um, I don't know. So Joe didn't really tip his hand. He doesn't really tip his hand with this stuff um, anymore. <laughs> so I, I I find it yeah. funny that I think clearly Quinn came in with some talking points from his agent because he had some like quotes in in particular that he hit and. There was one where he like pulled receipts up um, to quote Robert Sala uh, about like how the Jets haven't re-signed a first round pick on their second contract in like I forget how long it was or there's been like seven guys that they didn't. Jamal Adams is ultimately the one everybody thinks of. I think I wasn't here obviously when the Jamal stuff happened. I feel like this is different. I, I, Qu Quinnen's a more of a model citizen than Jamal was. Quinnen makes it a point that he did not want to talk about the contract at all during the season. Uh, anytime he was asked, it was not he deferred to his teammates even when you talk about his season he always deferred to his teammates like he was very good about that and you could tell this is something that was probably on his mind he had the best season of his life he's probably the best defensive tackle in football this year they need to bring him back I do wonder how the negotiations are going to go because I think he's going to ask for Aaron Donald money and are, is Joe Douglas willing to pay 30 million dollars a year to a guy I don't, I don't know that uh, Connor might have a better answer for that he has a better read on Joe than I do um so 
there's going to be a lot of negotiating. There's going to be a lot of like, you know, stuff like this and stuff leaked and stuff like that to try and um, pump up that number. I think there's a lot of defensive tackles that are getting paid this offseason. Dexter Lawrence is about to get paid. Jeffrey Simmons. Uh, I think there's another one that's due for a new contract. Chris Jones is probably due for a raise. So I think it would, it would behoove the Jets to get in front of the wave of defensive tackles getting all these contracts. And you don't want Quinn and Williams to be holding out when training camp comes around. I guess you can stomach maybe if he misses mandatory workouts, but um, I don't know. I, I don't really have a read of how quickly it's going to happen. I imagine they want to get it done. So I would think that would spur action. But again, I, I think he's going to ask for a lot of money. So I, it just comes down to how much Joe Douglas is willing to pay him, I guess. Yeah, I, th- I think that Zach. I mean, they're gonna they're gonna pay him. Like I, yeah. when when Joe started talking about Quinnen, like the first thing that I thought of was like, yeah, he's just doing everything in his power to not talk himself into the box like he did with Jamal Adams. Because when he came in, and, and it was very early in Joe Douglas's tenure, like the Jets did love Jamal Adams. They loved what he brought, and they had every intention of paying and extending and 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 moving forward with Jamal. But the problem with Jamal was that once he said we want to make Jamal Adams a jet for life. Well, Jamal sits there and says, you want to make me a jet for life. And you're telling me you don't want to negotiate a contract for another two years. Like what the hell dude? Like, so he talked himself into basically losing <clears throat> leverage with the Jamal Adams situation. Uh, and then obviously it all spiraled and, and derailed from there. And, and I can't remember the exact quotes, but he did something similar with Marcus May the ensuing year. I mean, it's just, it, it's, I think this was Joe just trying everything in his power to not let his private conversations with Quinn and Williams and Quinn and Williams negotiation or Quinn and Williams representation uh, get out into the public light. But the thing about the the Jets is like, when you know about Jamal, that's a safety. When you talk about uh, Marcus May, he's a safety. I mean, this is kind of the first time that the Jets have had a first round pick that they drafted be a true dominant game wrecking force. I mean, even Muhammad Wilkerson, when the Jets extended him, and even though that was Mike McCagna, not Joe Douglas, Muhammad Wilkerson was a good player. He had a really good year in 2015, but he was still that like 34 defensive end who wasn't really J.J. Watt, but also wasn't really bad. He was kind of in that middle tier. With Quinn and Williams, we're looking at a player that very well might be on Aaron Donald's level. I mean, he is that good. He is that dominant. He goes hard every single play that he's in there. He plays the run. He rushes the passer. Like we said, he's a model citizen off the field as well. He's somebody who I could easily see having the C on his chest, not for long. I mean, you ask anybody, I talked to Carl Lawson about this. I talked to Sheldon Rankins about this. You bring up anything on defense and all of the defenders go and immediately point to Quinn and Williams locker right over there on the left side and say, basically like, that's the guy who run- makes our defense run. It's him. Like you talk sauce, read me, that guy. No, it's Quinn. He's the one who makes it run. He is that disruptive. And when you have a force that's that disruptive on the middle of your line, Well, it's also just going to help everything outside. I mean, imagine if Jermaine Johnson develops or Carl Lawson recovers from that second AC or second Achilles procedure he had. And those guys are back to the players that you imagine. Bryce Huff takes the next step in his development. Well, you have a guy that is demanding double and triple teams on the middle. Then you have the force from the outside, plus those two corners the Jets have. I mean, it just makes the entire defense run. So the Jets can't afford to play hardball with this guy. The Jets can't afford to piss this guy off because everyone in the locker room is looking at Quinn and Williams as the heart and soul of this team. And I know that Jamal Adams negotiations were one thing. Jamal Adams was a phony. He was. And everyone in the locker room knew he was a phony. Like they knew he was a great football player, but no one viewed him as the captain that everyone thought they viewed him as. They knew he was the best defensive player, but he was not as well-liked as Jamal Adams tried to make it seem like he was well-liked. Quinn and Williams is. He is absolutely beloved by offensive players, defensive players, the coaching staff. And the Jets are going to do right by this guy. They are going to take care of this guy. The timeline of when it happens, I don't think the Jets are like, oh, it's January, whatever right now. We're going to go re-sign Quinn and Williams. But I think you'll see something get done with Quinn and Williams before the start of this year. The Jets are going to take care of him. The figure, we'll see how that works out. If he does get Aaron Donald money or just a little bit less than Aaron Donald money. But this guy is too, he's too good and too important to this team to, uh, to like I said, to, to kind of dick around. All right, we need to take another quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the injured guys. And obviously, they are key guys on this team. A lot of them spoke on Monday. Uh, and any other final thoughts from you guys as we head into If the your aisle. New Year's goals are to manage your budget better and save money, you need Rocket Money. Say goodbye to last year's outdated, disorganized methods of managing your money and say hello to Rocket Money, the better way you can hack your finances in 2023. Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills, all in one place. 
Over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about, like that streaming service you bought to watch just one show or that free trial you just never used. Rocket Money will quickly and easily identify your subscriptions for you so you can stop paying for the ones you don't want. Rocket Money makes canceling subscriptions as easy as a click of a button. Simply find the subscription you don't want and press cancel and Rocket Money will cancel for you. No more long hold times with customer service or tedious emailing back and forth. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving an average person up to $720 a year. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash athletic. That's rocketmoney.com slash athletic. Rocketmoney.com slash athletic. Quarterback was a big problem for this team. Offensive play calling we can talk about as well. But injuries were a major factor on why this team went from how the first half of the season went to how it went down the stretch. Brees Hall. Elijah Vera Tucker, Makai Becton, if you want to go way back. Uh, those guys, obviously, all there Monday as well. Um, just general thoughts. Um, Brees Hall had a lot of positive things to say, obviously, about this team. Um, Makai Becton, I guess, Zach, is is down weight-wise, right? Like That was the big news as far as Makai goes. Um, just overall, talking to these injured guys, was the vibe good heading into next year? Yeah, it, it, I always try not to. Every guy thinks they're going to be ready for training camp, so all of them yeah. said that. Like, I, I don't. I'd be shocked if Brees Hall was ready for training camp personally. Yeah. Um, th- those injuries, like nobody's going to rush a, run, a running back back to the first first day of training camp. Um, but I, I honestly, you you talk to those guys and you kind of remember like how much better it felt when Brees Hall and Elijah Vera Tucker were in the lineup. Like how much different their team was. And Brees Hall kind of funnily, he he's funny in that he can't help but like just say what he's thinking or what he's feeling or the truth. And so he, he said something like once I went down, the offense wasn't the same, which is an accurate <laughs> statement, but you don't Fair. usually hear that from like a player saying that <laughs> he, he like put it on himself, which, you know, is insane, but um, you know, it, it, they really, really missed him. And it's crazy to think about in 2023 that a team lost their running back and their offense fell apart. Like that, that's how it says how good he was and how they really need to work on the rest of this offense. Um, Garrett Wilson, obviously is a stud and they probably don't even like, they might not even win another game without Garrett Wilson the rest of the way. Uh, so they, I, I am concerned about Brees next year. I think the history of running backs coming off ACL injuries uh, is not good. The first year D- Dalvin cook wasn't good. Saquon was really bad. His first year coming out uh, there, there are, you know, exceptions to the rule and you, maybe they can get lucky with Brees, but I would be surprised if at in his first few games back at the very least, if he looks like the old Brees. So you do wonder what they do at running back this off season, but um, you know, that, that was a big takeaway. I, but my biggest one from all three of these guys, honestly, is Makai Becton because ultimately he's like an X factor for this team is they, they need to find a left tackle, um, probably a right tackle too, I guess, depending on how you feel about Max Mitchell. Uh, I I don't, Max Mitchell. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> uh, Dwayne, <laughs> Dwayne, Dwayne Brown. I'd be surprised if he came back at this point, George fans not coming back. So Makai Becton talent wise is better than all of them. Like he's be- he'd be their best offensive lineman if he's healthy and, and in shape. Uh, that's obviously been a big question. He hasn't played in basically two in over two seasons since his rookie year. Essentially, uh, he looks like he's in good shape. You 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 hope that he sticks with that and he gets to training camp healthy and he gets through training camp healthy. And you know, I think best case scenario is Makai Becton is your starting left tackle week one. I don't know if you can bank on that though as a thing. So he's he's going to be something I'm really going to keep my eye on this offseason. Uh, I am curious to see how Joe invests in the offensive line this year if he goes and pays for one. I know you're going to have to pay money for whatever quarterback you get. Uh, will he draft the 13th pick? You can get a good player there. Do you want that to feel like the move, right? That yeah. 13th pick. You can't, it, it, certainly it does, can't take a quarterback again. The, the problem is with offensive linemen like Makai or, you know, Andrew Thomas was bad as you never know if these guys are going to be ready when they get the league is the issue. So like Douglas needs to get the offensive line, right? That's the one thing he's, you know, that's Joe Douglas's reputation. He's supposed to be the guy that fixes this offensive line. And he tried, like he invested in guys. It just didn't work out because injuries or Lincoln Tomlinson was just, you know, not as good as they had hoped. Bad. Um, you know, and you know, they need a, they might need a new center. They they need to figure out where they want to play AVT. Like there's a lot of question marks on the offensive line. And and I think that's why I think Makai is the X factor here because if if they can if they can rely on that guy, or even if he can just play, you know, most of the season or something like that, like that that puts them in a great spot. They're they're obviously gonna decline his fifth year option. The deadline will be in May. Uh, there's there's no way they're gonna exercise that when the guy hasn't played at all. But He's going to be highly motivated. He has the athletic and physical ability. You just hope that he can can make it to week one. 
That's the big thing is he's Makai is like, and I, I, I honestly completely agree with Zach. Like, I mean, you could talk to Brees and, and every player I've ever heard that comes out of that basically says like, Oh, I'll be ready. Oh, I'll be good. I mean, it's just, it's what, it's what they say. Cause they're athletes, right? They, yeah. they feel like they can play the next week. I mean, if you ask a guy on an ACL, I'm sure if we went and we talked to Sterling Shepard, he'd be like, Oh yeah, I can probably play if we, if we make it to the Super Bowl. Like it's just, <laughs> it's what guys do. Like, that's just how they feel. But then you talk to the trainers and you're like, no, no, no. I mean, he'll probably be ready in like, the middle of August. And it's like that kind of thing, because you have to slowly ramp them up. If you try to do it too much, too quick, you tweak it. But the one guy that did stand out to me for the first time was Makai Becton. I mean, he looks noticeably thinner and he wasn't wearing like a muscle beater tee to like, I mean, he was wearing a hoodie. So like, if he like, it wasn't like he was trying to look thin, but he did look noticeably slimmer. He seems incredibly motivated. I loved that he said he's not only just staying in the area, but he plans on being at the off-season voluntary workouts, which was something that he skipped last year. Now, the big thing with Makai has never been talent. It's always been motivation because he hasn't necessarily always taken care of his body, which is why his weight ballooned. And he wasn't always in shape, which is why it tended to lean toward, uh, ten, uh, tended to, to pop with some injuries. Well, now he is clearly in shape. Now he is clearly motivated. And if that carries through, He's basically the scratch-off lottery ticket for the Jets. I mean, they can't, like Zach said, they cannot go into next year with Mackay Becton, Becton penciled in anywhere. Like, I'm not – he can't even be the pencil. Like, not, I might talk with the little eraser. No, it, you can't <laughs> expect anything from this guy because, again, there were – he had some very big, flashy, big blocks as a rookie, but there were still concerns with him his rookie year. Then he's lost all year two. Then he's lost all year three. Now we're going into year four. And much like we're talking about Zach Wilson and rolling the dice with Zach Wilson, the Jets also cannot afford to roll the dice with Mekhi Becton. They can't. Now, as far as drafting an offensive tackle in the first round, I don't necessarily know if they need to go that route. Now, the signing veterans, aside from Morgan Moses, hasn't exactly benefited the Jets to this point. But if they could find a veteran offensive tackle that they know can play, and I don't even technically in my head rule out the idea of Dwayne Brown coming back. Like, I don't hate that. I think George fans a hundred percent gone, Yeah, but I don't necessarily rule out Dwayne Brown as like that veteran presence. So you have theoretically a healthy Dwayne Brown. You have Mekhi Beckton as your lottery ticket. Then what you need to do is I don't think Lake and Tomlinson's getting cut. I've seen that floated around on Twitter. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous to yeah. me that they would move on. They would, lo- they would lose money by cutting him. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I've, I've seen the arguments made and it's like, <laughs> what but okay whatever uh they have to find a new center i like obviously vera tucker coming back at right guard and i know the jets i love max mitchell because he's just the nicest guy in the world <laughs> but i know the jets do love max mitchell as well like they drafted this guy and i was actually talking to willie cologne about it at sny the other day because I mean, willie knows his college coach and he's like no when they drafted max like a lot of people said he just didn't play top tier talent and he needed to work on his technique but like the talent is there and i think you saw it in in brief moments and he's coming yeah, back he from the good. blood clots he should be fine yeah so if you get Max Mitchell as your right tackle and you like your idea there, you get Elijah Vera Tucker, you have to find a center. I tend to think veteran, but they could easily go. I mean, you could find good centers in, in the end of the first round, second round, something like that, who can play right away. You've got your center. You've got your left left guard, Aiken Tomlinson. And then you kind of have that uh, roll of the dice of a proven veteran or Mekhi Becton at left tackle. I think that offensive line is good. I think that offensive line is serviceable. Or at least not, it's, or it's at least not terrible. I'm sorry to cut you off. Like they, yeah, not it, terrible. No, yeah, no, you're fine. Yeah, no, yeah. you're fine. People should cut me off more. I mean, <laughs> I mean like, like with, with Mekhi though, Mekhi is that X factor because we've always said this, like Mekhi Becton is the piece that can take the Jets <clears> offensive <throat> line from serviceable average okay and i would say like i say this all the time like an okay offensive line is good in the nfl like very yes. few teams have elite level offensive lines makai becton is that piece that can take a it's not an issue offensive line and make it a strength like if he is good if he is back if he is the player the jets imagined who had all all world potential he can literally take this group to the next level now is he going to do it we, we, you can't you cannot assume anything because even if he is in shape even if he is motivated, you can also make the comment, well, is he just not durable enough, right? I mean, we, we talked about this on this podcast a ton, where as soon as there was the foot injury with Makai Becton, that was where, like, the biggest red flag. Because you have a big guy who starts dealing with foot issues, that's usually not a great sign of what's to come. But we'll see with him, because he is that X factor. He is the potential change of it all. And we'll see what the Jets end up doing there. But he was the one injured Jet that stood out. Also, Zach, you probably have been this too. So, Zach wasn't covering the Jets yet, but I've never stood next to Makai Becton before because oh, yeah. he's either been like oh, far away on the yeah. field yeah, yeah, or up on the podium because of the COVID year. 
Holy shit, oh my that God, dude yeah. bit. Oh, the that best the, the best part the best Holy part was so they 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 do this thing where if too many people crowd a guy at the locker, they bring him over to like the podium. And so he people started crowding him. So he start he, they say he's gonna go at the podium. There's already a crowd of like cameramen and and reporters yeah. at the podium. And so Mackay Beckton, this large human, like like three yeah. of me, um, he, he has to like ask these cameramen to get out of the way. They don't see him coming. He's like behind them, this large man oh. standing behind you. And so he had to like ask them to clear a path. And it was, it, it cracked me up because he's yeah he's he's a like that's the thing. I'm sure that's why the Jets were so attracted to him in that draft too because he's just like a, a oh, yeah. freak of of physical and athleticism. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, some I, dudes I, are that big but can't move. Like he can move too. Yeah, like, exactly. he's like he's athletic. You just gotta stay healthy, man. That's yep. it. You just gotta stay healthy. I know. I know Zach has to get going soon. So I just want final thoughts here. Um, first time we've all been together on a podcast. It's been very cool. <laughs> this uh, is but fun. Final thoughts from you guys as we head to the. Uh, I mean, the Jets. <clears throat> Jets fans love the off season too, right? This is the, <laughs> the season where the Jets can win. It's. Yeah, I, I so I, I haven't covered the Jets in the past, obviously, but th- this feels like an exciting offseason to me because like the the playoffs do really feel within reach for this team. Like you have a really good defense. You know, they're have to make some changes. Their core is still going to be back. You know, you're going to have to decide. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think they're Connor kind of covered this when he reported yesterday about Carl, but I, I don't get the sense they'll cut Carl Lawson. Um, but you might you might have you have to figure something out with CJ Mosley because you can't carry a linebacker with a twenty one million dollar cap hit. Uh, probably cut Corey Davis, you know, Jordan Whitehead, maybe Braxton Berrios you think is gone. Um, and, and the thing that people always forget when they say like the salary cap isn't real is when you cut guys, you also have to replace them. And you have, and you, and yeah. the, the goal is to replace them with somebody at least as good, if not better. So uh, I don't think they're as flexible as like Joe Douglas indicated, especially because you're gonna have to pay like $30 million to Jimmy G or $50 million to Lamar Jackson or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's an exciting off season. I think, you know what they need. The needs are obvious. They need a quarterback. They need a tackle, uh, they need a safety, and maybe they need a linebacker. And I think if you fill all those spots and you bring back some guys, uh, like this is a team that you know should be in position to make the playoffs. It is it's hard to make the playoffs, but they'll be in position where you hope that they don't go on a six game losing streak to end of the year, but they end the season with nine or ten wins or eleven wins or whatever it is, and you feel good about the the future of this organization. And there's a lot of pressure on Joe to hit on all these pieces. He he, he needs to hit home runs like on all these guys. Like that's the reality, especially quarterback. Uh, mm-hmm. so there's a lot of pressure on everybody involved and I, I'm, I'm just, I'm looking forward to like figuring out what they do here. And the quarterback conversation is going to be fascinating. Uh, you know, D- Derek Carr is someone that's probably going to be decided pretty soon because of that Super Bowl deadline. Uh, so maybe we know soon, maybe we don't, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to see what plays out here. Cause I think the jets are an appealing destination for guys now, which, you know, before I covered the jets, I mean, they, I used to make jokes about the jets. That's from afar like it and so i'm uh I, i'm i'm very interested to see like the perception of them around the league and among free agents and and quarterbacks and you know stuff like that so i, I i'm looking forward to this offseason i i'm i'm with zach i mean i, I think it's going to be eventful I, I think this could be the year where we finally see joe hit the big trade because he hasn't yet we we haven't seen like he's flirted with things the hill the ridley all that stuff but he hasn't come away with the big fish yet and the big splash edition I think the 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 angry Woody Johnson plus the need for the playoffs. I, was, I think this is going to be the year we see the Jets make a really really big splash, and it could be quarterback. That wouldn't surprise me at all. It, like I've, I've said this, like not only do I think the Jets will be interested in Lamar, I think they have a really good shot at getting Lamar if the Ravens actually listen. Like if the Ravens are open to listening to conversations, which I don't know if they are, the Jets are <laughs> one of those teams that can make the package of picks and get it and 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 excite their fan base, excite their owner, all that stuff in position. Then we're now we're not talking playoffs. You put Lamar Jackson on this Jets and you screw up the offensive line a little bit. And we're talking like, man, the Jets could make a run at potentially the Super Bowl, right? So um, I'm excited for this. And I, I think Jet fans should be excited for this. I know the season didn't end the way that they wanted to. And it certainly wasn't the way that anyone expected it to because expectations change when you start uh, seven and four. But I do genuinely believe like this is a team that's in as good of a shape as they have ever been uh, since I started covering them back in 2014. I, I do really believe that. All right. Good stuff. Uh, the good stuff continues. We're going to have finally, everybody, finally, we're going to have Dane Brugler on the show. We made it to the off season oh, <laughs> without Dane, uh, but he's going to join us. And, and we have uh, another special guest coming this off season that I won't reveal yet. Yeah. Yes. And uh, yes, get excited for that one. So it's going to be a great off season. Uh, we will have a second episode this week with Dane. Then we'll slow things down a little bit, um, but tune in for that one for sure. And of course, anytime breaking news happens throughout the off season, we will be here for you. Connor, 
Great stuff going on at SMY. We appreciate you coming back on. This will not be your last time on the Can't Wait podcast. <laughs> I promise you that. Yeah, I, uh, I, yeah, I, I tell you, you guys having me back on was a blast. Like I miss this. Like I just, like I said, like I always said that when I took the job was like, I was ready to to go to something new and do something new because I felt like I had done what I wanted to do as a beat writer and I liked the TV opportunities. I liked what SMY was going to present me. But I remember like even when I put the name on the contract, like the one thing I was like, it's like shit, I can't do, can't wait anymore. So to come back and, and be a part of this. And Zach, you, you've done obviously a tremendous oh, thanks, job with man. it. I said this when you took over too, man. Like people are like, oh, what's Zach? Like what's that? I was like, the guy can write me under the table. Like he's a tremendous <laughs> storyteller. He kills it. And obviously you're doing a great job on the podcast as well when you're branching out into this. So it's been fun. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited now that I can, I, I, I'm to come back on a couple of times. So whenever you guys want me to shoot me a text, I know you guys still, hopefully I, Marissa might have me blocked, but, uh, <laughs> no, this was very, it. this was very nice, Connor. So thank you for joining and us. I, it was a good I, reunion. I, I feel weird about all the compliments. I don't know what to do with this, but yeah, I'll bring, I'll humble you. <laughs> it's called pod, well, Zach, podcast we'll, night. We'll, we'll do this. Uh, we'll do this on the metaverse next, right? Zach, cause you're going to get the, uh, <laughs> Connor's the, been the de- trying to get me to get the virtual reality thing. And I told him I'm finally going to do it. MetaQuest pro. He's going to get it. Yeah. He's gonna have it too. Watch, We're all gonna... watch movies together or something. He's like excited. That he, he's, he's hey, the one it. thing we didn't talk about it because it's in the chat. It was early and still is, is is hot coffee versus cold coffee. So we'll have mm. we'll have you oh. back on for that discussion. Zach's Connor, got a dentist appointment. The, the dentist nice, doesn't want to hear anything about nice coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Zach's got to go. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Uh, appreciate it. We'll talk to everybody later this week. Thanks for tuning in to the Can't Wait podcast. Cool.